Hi, I'm Jeremy Link, the President and CEO of Kiboku Gold. Thank you very much for joining us today as part of the Six Mix Summit to learn a little bit more about Kiboku Gold, which we feel is a multi-million ounce opportunity in the heart of the Abbey TV Gold Belt in Quebec. A quick note to let everyone know I will be making some forward-looking statements as part of this presentation. Now, Kiboko is a proven coarse gold exploration management team. We all met previously working in West Africa, where we reevaluated a project using coarse gold techniques to define a multi-million ounce open pit project that was ultimately acquired by Endeavor Mining for about $160 million. Following that, key members of the team got back together and decided to go out and find another project that was very similar to our Kalana project. And that took us ultimately to Valdor area of Quebec, the world's best mining district. It wasn't the location that attracted us to the project initially. It was that there was a, a large amount of historical data that we could use to help plan exploration programs and come up with a sense of what the exploration potential was of the pro is for the project. We've recently went public about nine months ago and raised money to go out and verify historical results uh, from past drilling so that we can report our own mineral resource, which we're targeting to do near the middle of this year. We recently wrapped up a almost 11,000 meter, 68 uh, hole drill program, and all the assays from that are essentially pending and should be reported in the coming weeks. Now, Kiboko's team is proven coarse gold experts. And when I talk about coarse gold, what I'm referring to is these, as you can see on the screen here in the, in the yellow circles, small grains of, of gold. Now, our team are proven experts, and some of the projects they've been associated with include um, the companies listed here. Uh, I won't go for each one of these companies and their projects individually, but what I will point out is all these projects had a long exploration history before they were reevaluated using coarse gold techniques. And once they were, tons and ounces were added quickly. The companies had access to capital regardless of market conditions and were ultimately acquired by larger companies. At Kiboko, we think our Hair Canada project is another one of these overlooked coarse gold projects and is located in a tier one jurisdiction. As a private company, we consolidated uh, six project areas covering about 100 square kilometers, about 55 kilometers north of Valdor. As I mentioned earlier, the project is data rich. When we uh, optioned, initially optioned the project, we went back to the historical records and we found out there was a tremendous amount of work done here historically. Nearly 140,000 meters of drilling, totaling over 937 holes. Uh, based upon the density of data, we've identified three primary areas for exploration. Uh, Duvet in the north, uh, Fontana in the center, and Mon Pass just to the south of Fontana. Uh, Fontana is our primary focus at this time um, because that's where the largest density of data is. As you can see, there's about 80,000 meters of historical drilling here uh, with some really uh, eye-catching headline results, such as 24 grams per ton over almost 11 meters, eight grams over six and a half meters, which would catch anyone's eye regardless of market conditions. Duvet and Mon Pass, have less exploration, but have also produced similar results. But as you can imagine, because we do have a coarse gold, not all the results are, have been this rosy. But we have been able to use these results to prepare exploration models, to guide our exploration, but also to prepare exploration targets for the potential that we see for the project based upon this historical drilling. Overall, for the Harakana project, we see the potential for 20 to 33 million tons at a grade of 2.7 to 3.6 grams per ton, which I think many would consider to be a uh, high grade for a project that would be open pit, which is our intention here. Uh, our initial drill program is focused on Fontana, which is just the, uh, um, and only a portion of it um, are we expected to um, um, verify and validate with our current drill program. Now, our immediate goal is to define a pit-constrained mineral resource. There is a uh, plan view of the exploration model showing some of the historical drill intercepts. Uh, you can see here that Fontana is large. 
This trend here is over a kilometer and a half long, and this corridor is, appears to be about a couple hundred meters thick. We've also got the bunkhouse trend here as well, also over a kilometer long, and also that zone has a good width. Now you can see here there are lots of gaps here in the model, and that's not because of complex geology, it's simply a result of a lack of data to populate the model. And the significance of this is more evident when we look at model its section. So what do we see here is uh, what you'd expect to see in the additivity. Subvertical zones of mineralization uh, within uh, that are structurally controlled. Um, I don't think you need to be an engineer to imagine that there is a open pit potential um, in all of these areas. And that once, oh, hang on, I'll turn the drawing feature on you, I'll do that. So I think you can imagine, it's not hard to imagine here that there's a potential for a pit here, maybe a pit here, and maybe a pit here. And with some additional drilling, perhaps you can see that the, that the mineralization would extend the depth. There's no reason why it shouldn't extend the depth. As we can see here, that there's over intercepts over 450 meters uh, from surface. But that's not our initial goal. Our initial goal is to define a near surface open pit and then come back with additional drilling to grow that to, to grow the deposit. Now, what are we doing different from past explorers? There's a fair bit of historical drilling here, uh, most of it concentrated in the uh, 1980s. And so people have recognized that there's, co there's gold here, there's coarse, and particularly that it's coarse gold, and they come back to explore, but they use the exact same techniques as the previous operator. And that's because they don't have experience working in moderate grade coarse gold system, whereas our team does. So what we'll do differently here is large diameter RC and HQ drilling to get more representative samples. The larger the sample, the more representative it should be. We're also gonna thoroughly assay every hole from top to bottom. You can see here on the picture on the left that past operators didn't assay all of the core, which is considered to be standard best practice nowadays. But even at this scale, you can pick up thin coarse veinlets in the unsampled material. And finally, we're using photon assay, a coarse gold specific assay technique, which coarse gold techniques have rarely been used here in the project with less than 5% of the historical assays using this technique. And to understand the importance of the right sample size and the right assay technique, is some, we can look to some historic bulk sampling results from the Fontana area of the project. At the Hooper vein, uh, about 1,600 tons of material were removed. Um, they did traditional fire assay alongside screen fire assay, which is another coarse gold specific technique. The fire assay indicated a grade of 2.6 grams per ton, uh, which is fantastic. You know, we're looking for an open grade, uh, so open pit near surface deposit. Uh, that would probably be considered high grade uh, by most people. But the screen fire assays reported 4.7 grams per ton, nearly 80% higher than what the screen fire, sorry, than what the original fire assay showed. Now, this doesn't mean that at Kiboka we expect an average lifting grade of 80% relative to the prior drill results. What it means is that this is coarse gold techniques are more appropriate, and that's reflected in the, what the mill recovered, which was almost five grams per ton showing that screen fire assay was more representative of the material than traditional fire assay was. Now, Kiboko has done, uh, has wrapped up nearly 11,000 meters of drilling in the last few months, uh, uh, sorry, wrapped up 11,000 meter drill program uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, we've reported some preliminary results uh, and they are what we would kind of expect for initial results for a fine grain coarse gold environment you know, what we've seen here is that there are high grade intercepts such as, you know, eight meters, sorry, eight, 8.7 grams per ton over nine meters and 24 grams per ton over three meters in a few holes. But what's really interesting to us is that we see there's also lower grade intervals. So for example, 0 0.9 grams per ton over eight meters, which we think has the potential to be underestimated based upon the sample sizes that we use in our initial passive assay. We're now in the process of doing a reassay program that was always planned to evaluate the project using much larger samples to determine a more accurate grade is for these veins and for the deposit as a whole. Most of these assay results uh, have not been reported yet, and that sentence is going to be coming out in the next few weeks to months. 
So our news flow here, as you can see, is Kiboko has been hard at work for quite some time. We've optioned and staked the land package. We uh, negotiated a new royalty agreement. We digitized 140,000 meters of historical data, went into the field, looked for callers, built models, uh, planned a drill program, wrote a report, did an IPO, uh, raised the funds uh, for the drill program. We've, we've now wrapped up the drill program, and now we're in the process of waiting for uh, the final asset results to come to the lab, which should be arriving in the next few weeks and be reported over the next couple of months. This is anticipated to result in a mineral resource estimate that we're targeting for the middle of this year. And that will be followed then by a phase two drill program that we will discuss more once we have the results back from the mineral resource estimate. Uh, a little bit more about Kiboko. Uh, Kiboko uh, has about 44 million shares outstanding. Um, last night, the closing price was about 15 and a half cents, giving us a market capitalization of about $6.8 million. Uh, Kiboko has a relatively tight capital structure. The management and board own about 35% of the company, and we invested you know, a half million, almost a half million dollars in the IPO round. Um, the rest is uh, high net worth and retail investors, a handful of institutions, and uh, Trezor Resources, who we optioned the property from, and then IR Battery and Processing, a corporate entity that we've uh, invested alongside in the past. Uh, prior to the IPO, uh, Kiboko's management board held about 98% of the shares issued in the company. So to wrap it up, Kiboko is a, has a proven core school exploration and management team. This is something that we've done before and something that we intend to go out and do again. We are, have a large land package in what I consider to be the world's best mining jurisdiction, the Quebec side of, sorry, the Quebec side of the Abitibi Gold Belt. We've got a project that is data rich that shows the potential for uh, a multi-million ounce near service deposit. We've just wrapped up a large drill program and most of the assays are pending for this program and they're going to be released over the next few weeks, which is quite exciting. And that's going to ramp up and lead into reporting of a mineral resource near the middle of this year. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is available here and on our website, and I'm happy to sit down with investors and discuss Kiboko's work in the past and where we're going in over the near term. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone to this presentation about Salon Graphite. I'm Sasha Jacob, the CEO uh, and founder of the company. I'm going to focus on two main aspects uh, for the company uh, in the presentation. Number one is the team and number two uh, is the product uh, and specifically what makes our product uh, unique uh, amongst um, other graphite uh, resources. So let's begin with um, our forward-looking uh, disclaimer. Um, the, the graphite that Ceylon Graphite has is very unique uh, throughout the world. Um, and to begin with, uh, perhaps just over, a quick overview of the importance of graphite within the electric vehicle uh, battery industry. Graphite is the largest component of an electric vehicle battery and is forecast by most uh, groups to be the largest in demand and demand growth uh, over the next 30 years, uh, including a very interesting report by the World Bank, um, if you have a chance to look up, that talks about all, all battery and energy transition metals and highlights the importance of, of graphite as, as a huge uh, demand um, forecast over the next uh, 30 years. Uh, our graphite is particularly interesting as it is in situ, naturally occurring at a 90% plus carbon grade. And that is uh, very distinct from other resources. Most other resources throughout uh, the world are you know, less than 10, certainly less than 15%. And this high grade graphite presents uh, several significant opportunities that, uh, that I'll get into uh, about the product. Um, the second uh, aspect here of our graphite resources is we control virtually all of the previous production of Sri Lanka in graphite. And Sri Lanka was previously the largest supplier of graphite in the world, uh, representing over 50% of, of the market uh, up until about the end of World War II. And the reason that it stopped um, production and decline then is one is price uh, and demand. And the other is that most of these resources were artisanally mined and um, the mechanization wasn't there 
once they went through the overburden to process that graphite in, into the uh, into the bedrock, which of course is there now. And we are prioritizing these areas and um, prioritizing different sites and to bring them into production, uh, two of which are, um, are licensed and near uh, commercial production right now. There are other, of course, other applications beside electric vehicle batteries for graphite. Um, and those are also areas that we may be supplying, but the absolute focus is the electric vehicle battery. Our team uh, is very diverse and very experienced in all of the important aspects uh, required to uh, manage and bring a graphite uh, resource into production, but also to focus on aftermarket value added um, and to be, have the skill set and relationships to deal at the highest levels of some of those offtake and JV potential partners. Um, so the, the board of directors has tremendous experience in governance, including governance specifically in resource companies tremendous capital markets experience. Um, a number of us, including myself, have raised um, you know, many billions of dollars of corporate finance as well as project finance, again, specific to infrastructure and resources and energy. I uh, have quite a bit of experience. Um, we have a tremendous technical team led by Dr. Malik Abam and Dr. Siva Abam, who have spent their entire careers specifically in this sector, in this vertical. Um, and um, have had some extremely senior roles in different companies and different uh, academic institutes and research institutes focused on this area. And hence, we have a very strong technical uh, portfolio um, that you might see in some recent news releases about different IP that we that we have. Um, Dr. Millie Kabam and Sivabam were previously also at a, uh, another graphic company called Talga, uh, which is a, a leading uh, firm in terms of um, technical, technol technology and applications for graphite. Um, we also have a very strong team on the ground. And so this includes a team, um, including myself um, and um, my uh, co-founders that have previously built a hydro company in Sri Lanka in the country that became at that time the largest hydro company uh, in the country with um, over 13 sites and uh, over 200 employees. So uh, we brought over $100 million uh, into the country, including equity and debt, uh, including a multilateral debt package that, um, that was arranged uh, into the country. And I should point out that this was all prior to the end of the civil conflict that was in Sri Lanka for many, many decades. Um, so we were one of the first teams that invested heavily and brought investors into the country uh, prior to in that conflict. And hence, we have, um, I think, a strong track record, a strong relationships in the country and on the ground. Uh, we were always very consistent in having strong um, social impact, um, community support, whether it's building bridges or healthcare institutes or um, or academic or other support. We have always been. And this is beginning back in 2004, being strong believers in social responsible investing and uh, ensuring that communities that we operate in uh, are are supported by the activities that we do um, from employment to, as I say, social aspects as well. And absolutely always uh, top environmental uh, practices uh, as well. Uh, in fact, those hydro projects we built in the country were some of the earliest to qualify for emerging market carbon credits uh, at the time. And this practice continues uh, with um, with our graphite operations uh, as well. Uh, we also have a very senior team um, in North America um, behind the scenes a little bit on the advisory side um, that has very strong relationships um, on the on the potential partner and um, JV side uh, as well. So just uh, some additional, I mentioned we're focusing on the team, which I just highlighted, but also the product. And the product has significant advantages because of its high grade. And the first is its environmental footprint. Because of its extremely high grade, there is no primary processing required. And this is an extremely important point because uh, every other resource that we're aware of has primary processing to take a low grade graphite, to process it, um, crush it, mill it, um, float it and then get it to you know a higher slurry um, that still usually doesn't reach the purities that we come out of the ground at naturally. And this is an incredible advantage for obviously costs and, and time um, and processing um, processing um, complications that can that can arise that we don't that we don't have. 
but most importantly for the environmental footprint. So um, the we have a life cycle environmental footprint that is extremely low due to um, negating the requirement for this primary processing. Um, in addition, we're using renewable energy resources. As I mentioned, we built um, a lot of hydro plants uh, in the country and we have access to those and will ensure um, that resources of power, um, as well as other environmental aspects, um, including waste management, are done at the at the highest possible uh, level. The second reason why it's so environmentally friendly is that all of our mining is underground. So you can see in the photographs an example um, of uh, of how benign it is to the to the surface. Very little disturbance there um, versus other sites, uh, graphite processing or graphite mining, which is open pit. Um, so we don't uh, we don't have that uh, that issue. Um, just moving on, I can talk a little bit about the, the resource. Now, this is a vein system. So uh, we won't have the similar type of, you know, huge resource numbers in a 43101 that might be found at other sites, but you can see the grades, you know, are, are very high. Uh, waste material is very, very small. We'll continue to update the resource numbers as as the as the mines are being brought into production and we are um, doing some horizontal drilling to identify the the um, the ideal areas to to mine in but this strategy is is definitely a direct to mine to production scenario and our cost for each resource is extremely low we're estimating approximately you know two million dollars per site to bring into production um, and we have as i mentioned k1 and m1 which are um, extremely near-term um, commercial production uh, that should be uh, commencing uh, quite quite soon. Uh, I mentioned the demand for for graphite. I'm, I'm sure most of you are quite well aware of the the huge demand, um, but I'll just highlight recent news, um, not reflected in this slide, but you'll see in our last news release, um, additional third-party uh, resource assessment uh, done by uh, Warwick, um, which shows that our material outperforms not only other natural graphite resources, but also additional, uh, also synthetic uh, graphite resources, which is a petroleum uh, byproduct and uh, definitely not environmentally friendly, um, but many manufacturers are, are still using a synthetic product. So our performance um, exceeds uh, all the, the other materials that are out there, both synthetic and, and natural. Uh, I mentioned we have quite a bit of uh, IP, probably won't go into that today, um, but you can look up a lot of that information um, on our uh, on our website and our recent uh, news. So again, just to highlight uh, quickly, um, I think significant advantage with the team, which has tremendous on the ground experience, research experience, capital markets experience, um, and great governance experience. Um, and uh, that is matched with uh, the product, which has unique benefits from its environmental footprint uh, and its performance and its cost. Uh, I should mention that cost is, uh, is estimated at approximately $200 per ton, so extremely low production uh, cost. Um, so I'll leave it at that for, for today. Uh, we welcome any questions by uh, email or phone call. Um, and uh, look forward to staying in touch as we bring these resource resources into production. Thanks for your time. Hello, everybody, and thanks, Cam, and thanks to all of you for uh, watching this brief introduction to B Metals. And for those of you who are new to our story, um, B Metals is, I think, a very unique explorer of, of precious and base metals. And we're backed by one of the largest gold producers in all of Canada. And we are the only company that I'm aware of, at least, that's exploring for high grade epithermal gold systems in Japan and uh, also for sediment hosted copper deposits in uh, Zambia. This is just a look at our forward looking statements. And I, I will be making, I'm sure, a few of them. So. Please feel free to, to read this at your leisure on our website, or you probably could hit pause on this and, and have a read of it uh, that way as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, why would you like to look at a company like ourselves? I mean, everybody says they have the best team in the world. Um, and I think that we can back that with a bunch of numbers, which I'll go through. But um, truly, I think we do have one of the best 
team of founding members. We've either discovered, constructed, and operated several mines around the world, and I'll get into a little bit more of that. We do have some really good access to capital, and that's highly critical in this business. We've so far raised $31.5 million to date, and uh, 14 of that has come from one strategic partner, which is B2 Gold. And we also have a lot of access to deal flow. It, it's not a great time, I guess, in the market right now to be making acquisitions, but we do have access to, to other properties. And at some point, you know, the goal for us is to either take our existing properties into production, or we acquire some other additional properties and take those into production, if not acquire a producing asset itself. But the goal is to become a producer. And we do have uh, very strong financing at the moment, we have about $6 million in the bank, and that should take us right through to completing our expiration in Japan for this phase and also for our expiration work in uh, the Zambian Copper Belt. And we'll be seeing results coming um, from Kazan in, in Japan uh, by the next coming two months. And then from uh, Zambia, we should also be seeing some results here, uh, I think, in the coming weeks. So we should have some better news flow coming up um, over the coming months. Just look at our team. Uh, I'll just point out a few, a few of the members here. Mark Conley is our non-executive uh, chairman. He was also the managing director of Papillon Resources. And Papillon owned the Focola deposit, which was acquired by B2 Gold. B2 Gold has now made that into their largest and most profitable gold centers in Mali. And uh, Clive Johnson is one of our founding directors. Uh, he is the CEO of B2 Gold. He's also one of our largest single shareholders. And uh, basically, the whole team is uh, very much related to either B2 Gold or BIMA, myself uh, as well included. Um, John Wilton is our CEO. He's also a professional geologist. And he was actually co-discoverer of the Ojikoto deposit in Namibia in the 90s. And that eventually was uh, acquired by B2 Gold. And surprise, surprise, that has also become one of the stable, stable assets in the B2 Gold portfolio. A couple more uh, people, Dennis Stansberry, he's also very much involved with uh, either starting or very early on with the BEMA Gold days, and then one of the founding uh, executives of B2 Gold. And he's basically responsible for uh, overseeing a lot of the construction for many of the mines that either BEMA or B2 Gold have put into production. He's also really instrumental on our team for um, either assessing uh, new properties that we're looking at, or, or of course, uh, existing properties that we have. He's been very instrumental in, in guiding us with uh, some of his engineering advice. and. Dr. Richard Silto, you know, can't say enough about him. Uh, you know, one of the best economic geologists out there. He, he's like a walking encyclopedia for properties around the world. Uh, he has also been really helpful with uh, exploring our existing properties, but also assessing additional properties that we've looked at over the past. And uh, again, we are led by some of the top mine finders and builders, and I can back that up with some of the numbers here. Um, you know, we've discovered more than 34 million ounces of gold, 56 million ounces of silver and 6 billion pounds of copper. Uh, in terms of raising cash, which is, you know, really vital for this business, we've raised over $3 billion um, US and that's for construction and operation of mines. And of course we have numerous um, exploration properties out of the group and then uh, production, you know, these guys have all had a lot of experience in the production um, side of the business. Over 9 million ounces of gold produced and generated over $11 billion of gold revenue. So um, I think we can back up uh, those statements that we truly are led by some of the best people in the industry. And just because I like numbers, I'll throw a few more at you. Um, when BEMA Gold was established in 1988, it just had a market capitalization of $34 million. And um, eventually they made the Kupel discovery and also made the, the Cerro Casale uh, discovery prior to that. Uh, that company was bought out for $3.5 billion by Kinross. Um, so that's a 10,000% growth in market cap uh, over that time. 
And then quickly thereafter, the guys got back together, started B2 Gold, this time with a $100 million market cap, has now grown that today it's in excess of $5 billion in market capitalization. And then us, uh, we're trying to follow the same blueprint as both BEMA and B2 Gold, starting off as an exploration company. Eventually we want to produce, um, become a production company. And of course, um, you know, make money for all of our investors and stakeholders. B2 Gold um, is definitely a huge part of our story. Uh, they are one of our largest shareholders at 19%, but also they get a lot of support or we get a lot of support from them, both technically, financially, uh, but also when we need advice um, on the legal side of things, uh, they've always been very helpful and um, are a key shareholder in our registry. So like I said, uh, we are a unique company in that we have a, a very maybe unusual portfolio, um, starting with, uh, we have five gold exploration properties in Japan, uh, one of which we are drilling as we speak. And then we have the Pengeni copper exploration property in Zambia. Um, again, both really great exploration uh, areas to be in, and um, we'll get into a little bit more. That's a Kazan property. So Kazan is actually a portfolio. It's um, it's five properties in Japan. Uh, we are looking for high grade epithermal types of deposits, as is some of our peers. Um, so if you look on the, the right hand side here, we have Japan Gold and Irving Resources. Um, both of these companies are also exploring in Japan for gold, and they are also backed by uh, senior producers. In Japan Gold's case, they are backed by um, Barrick Gold. And in Irving's case, they are backed by Newmont. And for us, of course, we're, we're backed by B2 Gold. So suffice to say that this jurisdiction is a very um, interesting area for senior producers. Why is that? Uh, mostly, I would say, because of this property here. This is called uh, Hishikari here in the bottom. Um, Hishikari is one of the highest, if not the very highest grade gold mine operating in the world today. Uh, it started up in operation in the 80s. It had a head grade of around 80 grams per ton. And then today is still producing somewhere between 20 to 30 grams per ton. Uh, over 30 years later, still very high grade uh, mining operation and still producing as we speak. So with that said, uh, we have started to do our exploration work here at our Kato property, which is in the northern island of Hokkaido. Um, maybe a little bit tougher for you to see, but uh, if you can look up at the kind of left hand or, or northeastern, or sorry, northwestern corner of the map here, um, that's where we've had some historic holes. Uh, the Japanese state agency called MMAJ uh, hit some really nice intersections there. One was 17 meters of eight grams per ton. The other was 18 meters of five grams per ton. We wanted to follow up on those holes and we were able to drill um, four uh, holes that intersected mineralization. We discovered which a new vein called Kamitake, Kamitake vein, and we also have the Seta vein. Both of these veins are trending from the north uh, western side of the property to the southeastern side of the property. We've now uh, just completed two more holes this year. And uh, the goal here is to both extend the mineralization to the southeast, but also um, confirm some of the grades in the middle section here. So uh, some of the holes here that you can see KT22 uh, 12 did get uh, mineralization, but it wasn't quite as high a grade as KT2211 or those MMMAJ holes. And that's because we think that we probably were a little bit too high in the system. So we're gonna be doing an undercut hole underneath uh, this one, perhaps under uh, the next hole 13 as well. So the goal would be to confirm up the grades that uh, have historically been um, drilled in the past and also to extend this whole uh, vein system to the southeastern corner of the map. 
And we're pretty confident that we will be able to do that. There were some rock samples that were taken in the river to the southeast. Uh, also, there's center um, outcropping coming out to the southeast. So we're fairly confident that we are going to hit. And uh, we will be bringing on a second rig, actually, because of the success that we had last year and, and um, thus far this year. We uh, have decided to bring on a second rig to the property. That new rig will be arriving here uh, in April, late April. We should have that operational by sometime in May. Um, so we are having good success so far. It is relatively slow because some of the, the, the terrain is relatively difficult to drill through. But, you know, we have been having great success uh, with the drilling thus far. And we'll have some more results coming out, I would say, by sometime, uh, either in April or certainly by May. And then we have another property that's also in Hokkaido called Todoroki. Todoroki is a past producing mine. Uh, it's tough to see, but these red uh, lines here would signify um, past mining uh, or past mine veins. This is an interesting property because it was uh, stopped or the, the production was stopped during World War II. And um, it was averaging head grades were around 10 grams per ton and it produced about 200,000 ounces of gold. Uh, it was stopped because of World War II. It was not stopped because of economics or low grade gold or running out of gold. Um, so we think there's really good chance for us to uh, drill some of these uh, vein systems and vein and especially towards the southern portion of the property and extend the, the known veins. And so this property uh, we expect to be drilled um, sometime around mid this year. So we'll either take the, the new rig um, that's heading over to Kato right now, bring it down to Todoroki to do two to three holes um, sometime this summer. Uh, so that one's going to be a really exciting one and uh, results will be probably coming out you know, sometime in the fall. And then copper exploration, um, very different terrain here. We're operating in the western side of Zambia where uh, some very large uh, mining operations are ongoing. First Quantum Minerals, just about 130 kilometers to the northeast of us is operating the Sentinel mine. Also, they have the Kansanchi uh, mine um, and Barrick has their Lamuana mine. Uh, they're both kind of lower grade operations, but very large and um, you're running around 0.5% copper, but huge tonnage. And uh, you also, in this um, Zambian copper belt, it, it's actually this the Central African copper belt as well, or is known as just the Zambian part is uh, what we're focusing on. But the northern part um, has the Kamoa Kakula deposit, which is still part of the, the same belt. Um, that is a higher grade deposit, but uh, but also has very large tonnage. Um, so basically, we are surrounded by some of the largest companies in the business, and we are looking for tier one deposits along the copper belt. Here's just a look at some of the uh, results that we've had to date. So we've managed to complete four phases of drilling so far. Um, Interesting to see that we are getting uh, on the D prospect or the northern section here, we're getting uh, about averaging about five meters of 0.5% copper. That's around the exact same type of uh, copper grades that you'd see at Sentinel or First Quantum's mine. Um, oh, sorry, um, the Moana's mine. And to the south uh, western side of the property, which we're calling the E or Q prospects. Uh, we're finding that we're getting um, higher grades, still similar intersections, but we're getting higher grades um, rocks. And so this year we're going to focus on trying to find out where the source of uh, the, these um, copper mineralization is coming from, both in the uh, D and E prospect areas and Q as well. So this year we should be doing about uh, 1,000 meters of core drilling and uh, around three to 4,000 meters of air core drilling this year. And then just a, a quick look at our, our ownership. So this is a really big part for us is that we feel everybody should have skin in the game. And so we have uh, our insider group has about 20% of the stock and that is growing. Um, Clive Johnson, uh, one of our founding directors has, has been buying shares actually just this week. And um, 
B2Gold has 90%. We also have a few institutions that have gotten involved with the stock. And then we have a pretty large chunk of retail shareholders. Uh, I would say a lot of them are probably still friends and family. And then just to look at the stock chart below, you know, now is probably one of the cheapest times you're ever going to see our stock. Um, so it's probably a terrific time to be taking a look at, uh, at, at picking up some shares right now. We have a good cash position. Uh, at the end of September, we had $8 million, but we're now sitting at about $6 million in the bank. And um, considering our market capitalization today is probably sub $20 million, uh, I think this is a, a really good opportunity right now. And if you want to get a hold of us, uh, you can reach me. Uh, you can hit me at uh, info at bmiddlescorp.com or you can just call me 604-928-2797. I'd be very happy to speak with you if you had any questions at all. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Ewan Mason and I'm CEO of Star Diamond Corp. I'm here today with George Reed, who's our senior technical analyst and world-renowned diamond expert. Uh, our main asset is 25% of the Falcon Diamond Project in Saskatchewan. Uh, Rio Tinto holds the other 75%. It's one of the largest undeveloped diamond mines in the world. Uh, a 2018 preliminary, preliminary economic assessment that we did uh, indicated a value of over $2 billion uh, and with a 38-year mine life and the, and the potential of cash flowing 25 to $40 million into the Saskatchewan economy. So uh, we've to date extracted over 160,000 diamonds, which you can see on our social feeds and websites. But now I'd like to turn it over to George to give you the story. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. I'd like to introduce you to our project uh, in Saskatchewan, the Star Ryan South Diamond Project, where we're advancing the world's largest and most attractive diamond development project. The Safe Harbor Statement, you can read at your leisure. Um, diamond projects are dependent on tons, grade, and diamond price. Diamond price is unique to the kimberlite that brings these diamonds to the surface, and usually it is log normally distributed. In other words, there are very many more little ones than big ones. But in some unusual cases, such as Letseng in Lesotho and Karoi in Botswana, you find that there are very unique large diamonds produced from these kimberlites, which have a dramatic effect on the average run of mine diamond price. As we can see in that table, $2,100 a carat for Letseng, almost $700 a carat for Karoi. And lo and behold, if we look at the size frequency chart on the right hand side of the page, we see that the, the main economic unit that makes up the star kimberlite, the early jolly foo, has been shown from underground bulk sampling to lie slap bang between Letseng and Karoi. And therefore, we can expect large diamonds in future production. Um, we have a very large long life mine, as Ewan has mentioned, 66 million carats over 38 years from the PEA, outstanding geology, attractive economics. We'll look at that in a bit more in a moment a low risk jurisdiction in Saskatchewan, near existing power transportation infrastructure and fully permitted uh, with both federal and uh, provincial EIA permitting. Um, the biggest uh, shareholder is Newmont Corporation with 14.9% of the outstanding shares. Um, unlike other diamond projects in Canada, we are not at the end of an ice road with uh, fly in, fly out access. We are in the middle of the breadbasket of Saskatchewan with road access 365 days of the year. We are 20 kilometers off paved highway to the east of the city of Prince Albert. And you can see in the, the Fort Alacorn forest outlined in purple, the kimberlites in bright yellow and the two kimberlites that have been extensively evaluated star and Orion South indicated in red. Um, notably, we are also only a short distance off the power grid of Saskatchewan. There is power generated in those hydroelectric projects at both upstream and downstream from Nipawin. Uh, the claim holdings is a contiguous block of claims covering these very, very large uh, kimberlites. Um, there are some 60 additional kimberlites that have 
only been partially evaluated. Many of them have been shown to contain diamonds, but Star and Orion South are the principal focus initially. A lot of work has been done in the past, namely core drilling to define the internal structure and the shape and size of these bodies, as well as underground bulk sampling with very extensive samples collected initially on the star. That program was then translated to the Orion South Timberlite, which lies only about a kilometer away. And unfortunately, while the bulk sample was being undertaken on Orion South, the world financial crisis hit us and the, the bulk sample was curtailed. Therefore, you can see in um, Star, we recovered almost 11,000 carats and with the largest stone being 49 and a half carats. However, with uh, Orion South, we recovered 2,300 and some carats with the largest stone again being 45.9 carats. There has been extensive large diameter drilling and the recovery of diamonds has been shown across these kimberlites with grade estimation, both vertically and horizontally across the kimberlites. Um, th there is a very attractive diamond population. Certainly the world average dollar per carat value is about $116 per carat now. You can see that we are well ahead of that value. $210 for Star, $169 for Orion South, and a weighted average of the two deposits at $190 per carat. These are driven by the characteristics of the diamonds. And notably on that slide, we highlight the uh, opportunity for type 2A stones. We will talk more about that in a moment. There are many high value diamonds in these deposits. This slide shows you some of the highest value stones cut, recovered from the underground and, core, and large diameter drilling bulk sample programs, namely this 11.96 carat stone with $11,000 a carat from the most valuable stone from Star and Orion South at 10.53 carat fancy yellow. Nice to have the fancy yellows present in the population at uh, $8,000 a carat. Um, the type 2A diamonds are very unique and very rare in most kimberlites. We can see that on a, when we look at world diamond production, some 1.3% of annual world production are type 2A diamonds. These are diamonds that are free from nitrogen and boron, but lo and behold, all the highest value large stones are type 2A and all of the very, very big stones, such as the Cullinan diamond, um, which was 3,106 carats when recovered, is a type 2A. So we see that the, the deposit that's known to contain the most type 2As is Letseng in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa, mined by Gem Diamonds. It has uh, an average of 29% type 2As, and we can see for star, we are only just behind that with about 27 or 26%. And then a smaller value for Orion South, but well ahead of the world average. Type 2As will be a real value driver of the future economics of a mine in the Fort Holocorn. Um, we have conducted a preliminary economic analysis in 2018 that showed very ac attractive economics, 470 million carats, uh, six, uh, sorry, 470 million tons, 66 million carats, 34 year life of mine with four years of development. Prior to that, um, and you can see the NPV numbers that are very strong listed on that chart. Obviously, we need to use modern techniques and cost effective techniques. We found that these kimberlites are buried underneath some hundred meters of overburden. The cheapest way to strip that overburden is with these electrically driven bucket wheel excavators. And remember, this makes us a very green project because we are using dominantly hydroelectrically generated power to drive such equipment. It is also most important in the recovery of large diamonds to use 
uh, X-ray transmission sorters, which can recover these large diamonds without breaking them. And you have an iterative crushing process to liberate the diamonds and recover the big ones early before they may be broken. Um, we see the general arrangement, uh, two kimberlites uh, around south going first, overburden waste pile, uh, centralized purple processing plant and kimberlite waste on the, on the east side. The Saskatchewan River does not affect the pit on star, nor does the pit affect the Saskatchewan River. We can see that in the future, we will have very strong uh, cash flow with an early period of uh, 3.4 years of uh, payback, and then it generates money very quickly. We notice that these two kimberlites, the blue shows the carrot production for Iran South, and the reds and yellows are the carrot production for Star. And you can see our engineers have managed to develop a plan that will run seamlessly from Orion South into the development of the star Kimberlight. Um, more recently, we have had Rio Tinto conduct a significant uh, trench cutter program where they recovered uh, a very significant number of diamonds, some, uh, some 24,000 stones uh, that they recovered from this trench cutter program that was used to confirm the grade and the value that we had done in the past on STAR. Um, we note the comparison of the Rio Tinto and the STAR diamond exploration techniques. There is a lot of confirmation that they have done uh, overall, looking at the diamond quality, the number of high type 2A diamonds, high value diamonds, the coarse size frequency distribution, the mining methods, um, Rio Tinto is very accustomed to truck and shovel, but they certainly saw that in this, op in this project, there was an opportunity to use bucket wheel excavators. They have also flagged the Orion North and Taurus Kimberlites uh, that are opportuni opportunities for further development. Um, in future, we need to evaluate whether we need to take additional samples on Orion South Currently, we are doing work to confirm whether an additional sample is necessary or whether we have sufficient um, diamond information to complete an updated feasibility study, which would be the next step in the development of this project. Um, notably, we, have a, um, we also have a project in Alberta where we are in 50-50 joint venture with Cantera. They are the operator. Um, it is, again, close to the power grid. It's road accessible. Um, and we can see we have a number of kimberlites, many of which are diamond bearing, and a few of which have produced interesting grade and diamond results, uh, along with some uh, high color yellow stones. There needs to be additional work done on these kimberlites, larger bulk samples to confirm these values. Very fortunately, these kimberlites are near surface. And many of them can be sampled during the winter by excavation and bulk samples collected easily. Um, we have recently done a diamond pricing exercise where we have shown strong prices it should be noted that these are very small early stage parcels from which the, these prices have been determined. But we have also noted that the proportion of type 2A stones in these four kimberlites of the Buffalo Hills kimberlites are elevated in type 2A diamonds, suggesting opportunities for big stones in the future. Um, we are led by our CEO, Ewan Mason. My background is extensive in um, diamond exploration geology, starting with De Beers back in 1984. Uh, Rick Johnson is our CFO. He has recently joined the company. He has vast experience in Saskatchewan. Uh, Mark Schimmel has been with the company uh, for a long time and has extensive diamond experience. 
I think that brings us to a close, and we are most uh, we are most excited about the future development of this large diamond resource in Saskatchewan. Thank you. Thanks, George. You can reach us at our website, stardiamond.corp. Thank you. Hi, and thanks for joining this webinar. My name is Ian Bliss, and I'm President and CEO of Northern Shield Resources. This is a presentation on a large-scale gold, gold project leveraged by the critical metals copper and tellurium. Now, you may not have heard of tellurium very much, and you're probably not alone, but I think the world's going to know about it in the not-too-distant future. Northern Shield's flagship project is a root and cellar property located on the Burren Peninsula of Newfoundland, a three-and-a-half-hour drive from the capital of St. John's. Recent discoveries in Newfoundland show that the province does indeed host world-class gold deposits. But prior to these discoveries, the talk of the, of the province when it comes to mineral potential and metal potential was that there's a lot of smoke, but not a lot of fire. Northern Shield never really believed in this philosophy, but it was simply a matter of the island hasn't been explored as well as other jurisdictions in Canada. And so Northern Shield has focused its attention on an underexplored tract of land in the Burren Peninsula of Newfoundland. And this is really our forte and our niche market. We like to go as far upstream in the pipeline of projects in the exploration and mining cycle. While many view greenfield exploration, especially early stage greenfield exploration as a risk, we also see it as an opportunity. An opportunity to find a tier one asset near or at surface and hence at relatively low cost. We implement what we call a model driven approach to our exploration to reduce any risk for ourselves, our shareholders and the environment. And that's how we come to our asset, the Root and Cellar Project, a gold project with a critical edge. It hosts a recently discovered high-grade epithermal gold occurrence associated with significant tellurium and copper mineralization in a porphyry style setting. The property has all the characteristics of what we call an alkaline related epithermal system. And I'll be more on this in the coming slides. And I say with recent significant advancements, and at the next stage of drilling on the root and cellar property, we believe it is well to position become the next mining focal point on the island of Newfoundland. Just taking a little bit closer to the root and cellar project, the root and cellar property covers over 100 square kilometers at the moment and is located right next to the town of Marystown, a mere, mere 10 minute drive from downtown. Now it's perhaps a little bit early to talk about infrastructure. Right outside of Marystown also, there's a deep water loading facility. Uh, port. And as I say, it's underutilized uh, at the moment. But again, with the root, with the Burren Peninsula, the benefit of the, of the Burren Peninsula is it's vastly underexplored, but you have a lot of infrastructure already in place. I mentioned that it's being modeled on epithermal gold and porphyry, porphyry copper. Well, epithermal gold and porphyry copper are related. They're really end members of the same system. Typically, if you're seeing the epithermal gold, it's about a thousand or so meters above the copper above the copper portion, which will be at depth. And so if you're seeing the epithermal gold, you may not expect to see the porphyry, but sometimes fortuitously what happens is the porphyry is telescoped or perhaps faulted uh, next to and just opposed to the epithermal gold. And we believe that's what's happened at root and cellar. So not only do we have the gold, we're starting to see strong indications of copper porphyry. And as I mentioned, this is being modeled on a specific type of epithermal system called alkaline related. Well, why is that important? Well, alkaline related epithermal systems tend to form very large and high grade gold deposits. Cripple Creek, Colorado, Porter and Papua New Guinea, and some of these Fijian deposits are all examples of alkaline driven systems. And they all have the correlation of both grade and tonnage. The other important aspect of alkaline systems that I mentioned is you get a lot of telluride rich mineralization in these systems. So what is tellurium, this critical metal that you may not have heard very much about? Well, it's actually one of the rarest elements on the planet and as a benchmark, it's about eight times more rare than gold. Its primary source is as a byproduct of a handful of gold, silver and copper deposits around the world, namely these alkaline driven systems. Its primary use right now is in solar panels. 
much of the world's solar panels are exported out of China and China has begun to limit the exports of some of that technology behind those solar panels. Tellurium is also used as a semiconductor because of its uh, energy uh, transport abilities, conductance, as well, and most importantly, it's also used in high efficiency lithium tellurium batteries, which are in the experimental stage and the late experimental stage. These batteries are what we call solid state batteries. Uh, so they don't have the fire risk associated that lithium ion batteries do, but much more importantly, they have over three times, somewhere between three times and 10 times the energy storing capacity for the same weight as lithium ion batteries. And so down the road, cars will be able for the same amount of weight of the batteries to be able to drive three to 10 times further. And much more importantly, in other devices such as drones, whereas weight is a significant factor in, in the battery, uh, you'll be able to get a lot more, say, energy uh, for the same weight of battery. And so you may not have heard a lot about tellurium right now, but if these, these experimental stage batteries come to fruition, which is looking likely, uh, you know, the, the tellurium may become uh, the new lithium. So going into detail now on the, on the root and cellar property, we have five gold showings over a six kilometer strike length. At the center of this, we have the conquest zone with very high gold grades up to 111 grams per ton. At the western end, we have something called the drop zone, characterized by very high silver values, up to 1400 grams silver, but also more importantly, 700 grams per ton or 700 ppm tellurium. That's similar to windfall where we also see very high silver and tellurium values. And Braxton Bradley is the only showing we haven't been to on the project yet, discovered by a prospector but and it's never been analyzed for tellurium but based on its high silver and other geochemical signatures i'm quite certain that once we get some assays back this will also come back with tellurium so the sort of northern flank of this volcanic complex where all this gold and silver is hosted uh, seems to be a tellurium rich zone as i say there's five gold showings but also at the western end of that is a very distinct copper bearing zone and i say northern shield and this is a critical point to remember is that northern shield is the, is the first company to conduct methodical exploration on this project. Now, zooming into the conquest zone, the heart of the gold bearing target set at Root and Cellar, the original discovery was made by a prospector here by hand grubbing a trench where 48 grams per ton of gold was found, including visible gold. Since Northern Shield was involved in the project, we've now expand that to about a 700 meter strike length of near continuous gold mineralization on surface. And again, you can see some of these numbers from very high grades of gold, including up to 111 grams uh, per ton gold. And visible gold is becoming more common. In fact, the last three trips to the projects by our field crew, we have, we have identified visible gold, including last, last month, uh, digging through the snow, we found some visible gold. So if you can do that through, through snow and mud, we imagine there's a lot more around. There are just some examples of the visible gold. Some of it's quite quite large and quite flaky, always associated with a small lot of quartz blebs and quartz, uh, quartz veining. And as I say, we've found gold uh, the last three successive trips uh, to the project site. Now, moving on to the gold, we'll now introduce the tellurium. As I say, we have uh, three occurrences of high-grade tellurium in the drop zone up to 700 ppm, windfall, as I mentioned, 40. And more recently, we discovered a molybdenite vein in the copper bearing zone that also carried 330 ppm tellurium. So these are very high grades of tellurium values on the outskirts of this volcanic center. But perhaps more importantly, we have about 350 samples in the conquest zone in the center of the project area that contains modest grades of tellurium with, with say, 350 samples analyzing over 10 parts per million uh, tellurium. So that's not only important for the added value of a potential gold or silver or copper deposit here, but tellurium in this case is also a very good indication of the copper porphyry potential of the project and is often used as a pathfinder and a vector towards a copper in a porphyry system. So again, just highlighting the copper, all the green circles uh, are on copper anomalous soil samples. The squares represent rocks, uh, copper bearing rocks and you can see it forms a very distinct zone separate from the gold. The gold high, highlighted by the yellow dots and squares form on the periphery of the copper bearing zone and again in these porphyry gold systems you get very strong zonation uh, as you see here. 
to date, we have over 72 samples from the, from the property running over 0.1% copper with a high of 10.5% copper. And that's we're even found in these quarries down here, which we'll have a closer look at. As I say, with the high grade copper, uh, up to 10.5% has been found in, in quarries that are the quarrying for road crush. And these are composed of what we call a vent breccia, where at depth, you probably have an intrusion. It's interacting with water, which of course creates steam and explosion, and it's fracturing the rock above that. And typically in, in a copper porphyry system, you'll expect the main porphyry to be sitting on top of that intrusion somewhere at depth. But what we're finding in these corrents is fragments of copper bearing rock and where perhaps copper, por copper mineralization has infiltrated up through the cracks and, and precipitated in voids in those breccias. So we see abundant copper mineralization in these, in these breccias on surface in these quarries. And that's a good indication that likely at depth, sometime right below Santam off to the side, uh, we may find porphyry copper system. As further evidence of that, we, all, we have number one, a uh, whole suite of pathfinder elements, arsenic, antimony, and also tellurium sitting in here. These are all as good vectors towards copper mineralization. They typically form on the flanks or the shoulders around uh, the copper bearing area. And so, and that's exactly what we're seeing at root and cellar as a pathfinder halos around the mineralization. And on top of that, we also see abundant, what we call propylytic alteration, sometimes called green rock alteration. You can see why. And we see that very, very intensely, particularly in the conquest zone uh, to the northeast of the copper, uh, as well as to the northwest coinciding with those geochemical anomalies. So we have geochemistry pointing towards the copper porphyry, as well as the alteration process. And one of the more recent identifications that we came across indicating copper porphyries is something called B veins. For the geologists out there, you may be familiar with these, but B veins, which are these sort of thin parallel wall veins, often with a hairline fracture, sometimes filled with calcopyrite in the middle. These are what geologists call B veins, and they're a very good indication of copper porphyries, and they again provide a, a vector towards the mineralization. So just to sum up, Northern Shield has a 100% option on a very large epithermal gold system, which is being leveraged by a critical metal tellurium, perhaps one of the more critical and more rare of these elements. We also have a very early indication of abundant near surface gold mineralization, including visible gold, which is becoming more common in the conquest zone. And I say near surface gold deposits are becoming uh, more rare to find in Canada, and yet we're have a good indication of near surface gold mineralization uh, 10 minutes from infrastructure on the Burren Peninsula of Newfoundland. As I said, the data suggests the system is alkaline related and due to their associated size and high grade of these systems, these systems are highly prized yet really found uh, in Canada. Now, calic systems are often associated with tellurium, uh, which is now deemed a critical metal and with grades of up to 700 grams per ton tellurium have been found at, at root and cellar. And I uh, say we'll have more samples coming in in the coming weeks uh, from the Braxton Bradley showing, which we believe will also contain high grade tellurium. The second phase of drilling is currently being planned on the property for late spring and early summer. This will expand the near surface gold mineralization that we found and test some of the feeder structures at depth, uh, which we believe are the main gold bearing uh, targets. And of course, on top of that, we have very strong indications of a porphyry copper system that's been overlapped on the gold and tellurium. So just to quickly summarize the corporate structure, we have about 67 million shares outstanding right now, which uh, management directors own a little bit over 12 and a half percent of that. And so if you have any further questions, that was just a quick overview of Northern Shield and our root and cellar project, uh, which is now has very strong indications of tellurium, a new and rare critical metal that we believe will be, uh, uh, you know, essentially the new lithium uh, going forward. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and contact Northern Shield through any one of those mediums listed on the slide. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Wilton, the CEO of First Mining Gold, and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, corporate update presentation brought to you as part of Six Mix. Thanks to our partners at Six for putting this on. Uh, lots of very exciting things going on at First Mining Gold. Uh, this is a company that really is pretty meaningfully transformed over the course of the last 12 months. 
with uh, particularly the addition of our Duparquet project in Quebec. So we'll walk you through uh, in in uh, reasonably short order here. Walk you through uh, presentation update, and uh, we'll look forward to getting any more information or giving you access to any more information you might need. So I'm going to be making a few forward-looking statements here in this presentation. Um, first, mining. For those of you who might be new to the story, we own two world-class multi-million ounce gold projects in the world's most prolific and friendly mining jurisdictions in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, our pre-feasibility stage uh, spring pool gold project, uh, one of the largest gold projects in Canada and is well advanced in the feasibility study and through the environmental assessment process. And our recently acquired Duparquet project uh, and our Quebec assets also represents one of the largest development uh, gold development projects in the province of Quebec, located right in the middle of the Abitibi Gold Belt, one of the most prolific geologic uh, gold districts in the world. Um, uh, we have a number of other joint venture projects and interests that gives us a lot of financial flexibility in moving these big projects forward and a team uh, of experienced professionals in exploration and environmental assessment and in development uh, that we have in place to really help us advance and unlock the value of this asset base that we have. So again, a uh, quick snapshot of where some of our projects are. The real two focus projects, as I said, the Spring Pool Gold Project uh, and the Duparquet Gold Project in, uh, in Quebec. The other assets that we have, again, a 30% interest in the Pickle Crow High grade gold project being advanced by our partner, Ateco Minerals. Uh, a 49% interest right now in the Hope Brook Gold project in uh, Newfoundland being advanced by Big Ridge Gold. And we're still the largest shareholder of Treasury Metals, which is advancing the uh, PFS stage Goliath Gold project located just outside of Dryden, Ontario. So lots going on inside this portfolio. And I think important to take away from this is total resources. Um, in terms of uh, measured and indicated resources in excess of 9 million ounces, inferred resources, another 3 million ounces. These are one of the largest gold endowments inside any company. And all of these assets sitting in tier one strategic mining jurisdictions in Canada. So very uh, exciting and very good leverage to this increasing gold market that we're in right now. Um, currently sitting today, first mining uh, with about 800 million shares outstanding, market cap of about 150 million Canadian, uh, sitting with cash on hand uh, of around $15 million, and then marketable securities around another 10. Uh, future cash and share payments and our and our option deals there, you can see again in excess of $40 million of uh, of other things on the balance sheet. So. Um, really uh, interesting portfolio for us to be moving forward here. Um, uh, and again, what I love about this portfolio and the exciting opportunity that we have is that we're sitting today with two of the 14 largest gold projects in Canada. Uh, when you look at the projects on the uh, left-hand side of this table, um, many of those are projects that are in construction right now. When those are done, uh, we are going to be sitting with two of the top 10 undeveloped gold projects in Canada, including one of the most advanced at Spring Pool. So very, very exciting opportunity here for advanced stage projects that you can acquire today at really unprecedented values. And we've, we're in this really interesting time in the markets where the gold price is really started to react to the macroeconomic and, and uh, macro political environment that we're in. But the, the, the share prices and market caps of particularly development companies uh, have really not moved at all. In fact, they've come off by about 30% this year. So first mining today is trading at less than, well less than $10 an ounce. And we have all of these major world-class strategic projects in tier one jurisdictions. You're seeing this gap between the valuations of senior producers and intermediate producers really moving out uh, past the advanced stage developers. So we have a lot of room for the share price to move up uh, just in terms of reversion to the mean around where advanced developers trade versus where we trade right now. And we're well on the path from a, from a fundamental perspective and a technical perspective to be moving that forward. 
we are sitting with two projects in in advanced stages of project development and this is a part of the of the mining valuation curve we call the lasan curve here which you did a great presentation with our our friends at six earlier uh, in the year around where you where we are in the lasan curve we call it the orphan period but this is this is the hard yards where you're taking a project from an existing uh, understood geologic resource and, and taking it through the environmental assessment, feasibility and permitting processes to really get it to a point where it can go into construction. So, um, you know, this is a point where I think you are shortening those timeframes to the real re-rating that comes as projects get built, but it really is a sweet spot in terms of finding value in projects uh, and value in gold investments right now. I think this is the deepest value part of uh, of the gold sector to be investing in. Um, again, a great team. Uh, you know, a company is founded by Keith Newmeyer, who's the founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver. Uh, but a great team that we've put together over the course of the last four years that I've been here uh, to really move these projects forward. Um, it's central to what we do uh, is ESG. There's a lot of what we are doing in advancing our projects is environmental assessment. It is baseline environmental studies. In Quebec, it's understanding and starting to work towards mitigating an environmental legacy from a past producing mine. So all of these uh, things is really kind of baked into the DNA of our company. Uh, and as we say here, ESG, you know, not just central to our business. I think our business is ESG. So we'll talk a little bit about Spring Pool here. Again, a unique strategic gold assets, uh, 3.8 million ounces of reserves. Um, and as scoped in our pre-feasibility study, average annual gold production of in excess of 300,000 ounces a year. This would make it one of the largest gold producers in Canada. So this is a project that's big enough to be meaningful and strategic to the largest gold producers in the world. Very robust economics. It's a, it's a low grade deposit, about one gram gold and five gram silver, but really robust economics given um, really the, the nature of the ore body itself and that it's a big bulk tonnage disseminated ore body, which you can mine very efficiently and in a small footprint which is uh, is something that I think our team has really unlocked as we've gone forward in this development plan. But in addition to having, you know, these uh, call it four and a half, five million ounces of resource at the project, one thing we're, we're equally as, uh, as excited about is the exploration potential around Spring Pool. So we think there's room for the Spring Pool deposit itself to grow in parallel zones. And then uh, regionally, over the course of the last couple of years, we've doubled the size of our uh, mineral tenure holding here. Uh, and with our exploration team, been doing great work to really start unlocking the potential in this district. So we've actually been out now and have uh, drill tested four regional targets. Um, and I think we're very excited to demonstrate that where we are with the 5 million ounces at Spring Pool really is the starting point to a district that we think we'll be exploring and producing from for a generation. So very exciting opportunities there. And lots of great, as we say, uh, great exposure to a potential growing gold resource here. Um, the main timelines uh, moving forward with Spring Pole, obviously uh, the pre-feasibility study update, uh, we're just right now getting a sense of, of um, uh, moving forward with our feasibility work. The project is, probably 75 to 80 percent uh, through all of the feasibility study work that we need to do. So metallurgy uh, is substantially complete. The process flow sheet is substantially complete. Uh, mining plan is substantially complete. So um, we think this might uh, manifest itself as a pre-feasibility study update later in the year, but really driving toward submitting the final environmental assessment document in the first half of 2024. So it's important to understand we published the draft EA document in uh, May of last year. We've received all of the comments back from the regulators, and we're now working through a comment response period. But you know, I think all of the regulators have now seen the, the plan that we're putting forward, and still lots of things to discuss, but we're very confident in the path that we're moving toward, which is submitting a final EA uh, in the first half of uh, 2024, ultimately finishing a feasibility study 
so that we have a fresh feasibility study coming through the EA process and targeting that environmental assessment approval uh, really, you know, around the middle of 2025. So while this has been a long-term process, we've been in the EA process since 2018, we really are now at the point where that finish line is in sight. And I think that's a significant de-risking and uh, a really significant opportunity to see value re-rating uh, in our share price. Because I think when you demonstrate that you can permit and build this big, robust project, uh, we think that's going to be a real catalyst for re-rating the stock. Uh, so that's Spring Pole, and we're very excited about how that's moving forward, but equally excited about Duparquet, where we've continued to consolidate a land package. This was a project that we own 10% of since about 2016 and had an opportunity last year to consolidate the other 90% of it. So sitting today, uh, 3.4 million ounces in MI resource, another 1.6 million of inferred resource at Duparquet. Uh, and we have other projects that we've now joined up in a contiguous land package, our Pitt and Duquesne projects. Um, uh, and we've uh, recently purchased some, uh, some mineral tenure from I Am Gold, which actually connects these two projects. So it's now one consolidated package. Um, this is a project that a lot of people had forgotten about, but it's seen an enormous amount of work. So 270,000 meters of historical drilling done between 2008 and 2013. Um, you know, reasonably full scale environmental assessment work that was done in 2012, 2013. Pre-feasibility study that was put out in 2014 by our predecessor, Clifton Starr. So this really is an advanced stage project that we were able to acquire for around $25 million in total. Um, and one of the things that we're really excited about with this project is inside uh, the open pit, which you can see here, um, you know, has very good grades for open pits in places of, of amazing infrastructure like it is. Um, there is a higher grade core inside Duparquet that we think could provide a really interesting kind of starter kit for a project that could could get into production. So we're right now we've kicked off a, a preliminary economic analysis uh, that's in process. We'll aim to have that out before the end of the summer, just to give uh, give investors and our communities around Duparquet a sense of what that game plan is going to look like moving forward. But we're very excited here, and on top of that you know, not just around the development of what we know is there right now, but in this region, in the Abitibi, you know, this is a, a project that is, has been very lightly explored outside of the existing deposit. You know, many of the, uh, of the big deposits in the Abitibi go down, you know, more than a kilometer down. We've only got a handful of drill holes at Duparquet that go deeper than 500 meters. So we think there's lots of room to continue to grow this along strike, at depth and then in some of the parallel zones where we've uh, continued to add more ground and you can see here the areas in the blue that we uh, acquired from i am gold earlier this year so we've now tied this up in a contiguous package and think that there's some great uh, exploration potential around duparquet that we're very excited uh, formulating our first drill programs right now and hope to get drills turning before the end of the second so very excited in moving that forward. Um, the work program here, really, it's been great to be uh, building relationships with the municipality at Duparquet. This is a, a proud mining community. The original municipality was built around the, the, the historic mines that operated from the 30s to the 50s. Um, but really starting to understand and, uh, and really looking forward to working with the community there. And really prioritizing environmental work in its in its first instance, and and deepening our geologic understanding as well. So lots of catalysts and and news to come out of Duparquet over the course of this year, with an updated economic study, which I said again before the end of the summer. Uh, exploration data has all really been compiled, and we're looking forward to getting a drill program uh, underway there as well, as well as uh, really formulating that environmental uh, baseline work that we're continuing to move forward. So again, very, very good exploration potential here. And when you look at what some of the historic results have been like at Duparquet, um, this is one of the, we think, one of the most exciting uh, opportunities to grow 
what is already a world-class size deposit in the middle of the best mining jurisdiction in Canada. So um, again, from a first mining perspective, we think that there's, we've got well in excess of a billion and a half dollars of fundamental value in our projects as we're sitting here today, trading at uh, less than 150 million of market cap. And just reversion to the mean, trading uh, as advanced stage developers do, even in as beaten up an environment as we are right now with the advanced stage developers, um, we think there's obviously very clear path to multiples of our current share price just in executing on our plan here going forward. So um, with that said, uh, again, we've talked about what the other assets are um, and some of the, uh, the other catalysts there, but new resource coming out at Pickle Crow, uh, recent resource has just come out at Hope Brook, growing that, growing that total resource there uh, to an excess of a million and a half ounces and at, uh, at a hundred percent owned Cameron project, uh, really kind of looking forward to, um, uh, hopefully getting some exploration work going uh, at Cameron as you move forward here. So uh, with all that, just like to say thank you very much. And for more information, uh, visit our website, www.firstmininggold.com, or feel free to reach out to Paul Morris, our Director of Investor Relations at paul at firstmininggold.com. Um, lots going on, a very, very catalyst heavy 2023 coming up and uh well if there's any more information please uh follow us on our uh, on our website or please do get in touch thanks very much good afternoon i'm happy to be at six mix uh, i'm going to tell you a little bit about reunion gold and our projects in guyana so Reunion Gold is an exploration company focused on the Ghana Shield in South America. In 2020, the company made a major discovery at the Oko West project in Guyana. Well, Guyana is one of the uh, fastest growing countries in the world. Uh, it grew last year at 62% and is expected to grow this year at over 25%. It's really due to a, a major oil discovery offshore. And so it's a very exciting country going through a significant transformation. Uh, it now has one of the highest GDPs per capita in South America and is expected to be in the top 30 in GDP per capita in the next uh, three years. So our discovery, which was made in 2020, uh, is a very exciting one. It's in a very mining friendly jurisdiction. Uh, it's a stable English speaking country with a parliamentary democracy and British rule. There's a long history of mining gold, bauxite, diamonds and manganese in Guyana and uh, really uh, a lot of significant new investments are being made in the infrastructure which is underway thanks to the booming economy uh, it has a long stable mining act and fiscal regime that was really last updated in 1989 clear licensing and permitting rules around environmental obligations and uh, environmental permitting uh, under the ministry of natural resources so the discovery itself uh, Oh, sorry, uh, talk a little bit about the company's team. So it's a very strong leadership team. We've been operating in Guyana for uh, a number of years now, over 20. Uh, and the combined uh, leadership team that includes management and board has over 225 years of combined experience in the Guyana Shield and have been involved in building a number of projects, including Matthews Ridge, Omai, and Roosevelt. The project's located in the western part of Guyana. Uh, it's, it's located in the Amazon rainforest west of the Essequibo River, about 100 kilometers from the capital city of Georgetown. Uh, the mine can be accessed by uh, boat and by uh, road. Uh, it's about a four hour trip between Georgetown and the site. And there is a major road that, that uh, accesses the property about 65 kilometers inland from the Essequibo River and about 15 kilometers off that main road. Uh, so we have good access and we have uh, um, um, good, um, good service and supply routes for bringing in materials. Uh, we located the mine, it's a historical alluvial camp um, and the original discovery, which uh, was made in 2020, uh, was a new discovery and uh, active uh, artisanal mining in the area really was the key reason why we went to the area looking in the first place 
and it helped us to locate uh, potential targets which to test. We did find uh, a major uh, geochemical an anomaly and a structure that ran north-south along a shear contact between the granites and the volcanics as a typical uh, uh, greenstone uh, belt or greenstone, uh, uh, greenstone deposit. Uh, it's an orogenic gold deposit, and it's uh, it's very common in this uh, greenstone type uh, environment. So, from the from the original uh, optioning of the property agreement in 2018, the company has advanced the project quite quickly. Uh, we've now completed over 75,000 meters of drilling. And we've identified a mineralized envelope that goes approximately two kilometers long strike and to a depth of 575 meters. The uh, continues uh, at depth to as deep as one kilometer. Um, so we've got a substantial discovery here. And we've really only explored the top two kilometers of a six kilometer trend. Uh, so we continue to uh, complete the drilling and the infill drilling of this uh, particular trend. Uh, we now uh, expect to be uh, at the stage where we'll be able to produce a mineral resource estimate in a, about June of this year and then move to a preliminary economic uh, study uh, towards the end of the year. So the project is advancing quickly uh, and we are uh, still continuing to explore the property at the same time while we advance this initial discovery. Uh, along this this trend. You can see on a cross section view that the uh, ore is quite thick. It ranges from 70 to 100 meters thick. It dips about 65 to 70 degrees to the east and is very continuous along that entire sh uh, shear structure. It's hosted in a granite hanging wall and granite foot wall, so there's very competent uh, wall rock surrounding the deposit, which makes for a, a very attractive uh, open pit. Uh, with, with stable uh, hanging wall and foot walls. There's a saprolite layer on top of the ore body, which allows us to mine a, a fairly high grade uh, starter pit uh, that runs quite deep all the way down to the 600 meter level. Um, you can see uh, in this uh, diagram here, this pink area represents the higher grade saprolite zone that or higher grade uh, core zone that runs in the middle of the deposit and dips sort of northeast uh, at, 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 at about a steep at a steep dip uh, towards the north and the east. So that's just the uh, the upper two kilometers of that uh, shear structure. Uh, continuing in, uh, further south, there's still a, a lot of area to explore yet along that structure. Uh, the southern zone we call the Takadu zone is still relatively underexplored and uh, we have plans to to do some initial exploration work on this zone uh, this year along with several other zones uh, to the west of the deposit. Uh, so far we uh, expect to put about 100,000 meters of drilling in this year uh, of which about 70,000 will be for uh, definition and the other 30,000 for exploration. We're very active on the ESG front. Um, we're initially completing our environmental baseline work and doing the uh, wet and dry season biodiversity studies, water quality studies, and the baseline surveys. And we'll continue this year with the second season of uh, environmental baseline work, which will expand to include the uh, climate and the archaeology and the uh, social uh, and the environment uh, social studies. Uh, Part of the um, baseline work. Uh, we have uh, started uh, annual bursaries for education at the Geolo Geological Sciences Studies Program and we offer a number of bursaries which uh, helps both us and the uh, university to uh, develop a young geologist. Uh, many of those are coming in to work for us under apprenticeship programs uh, and, and we also are active in a medical outreach program uh, which deals with some of the health problems in the area, in the Amazon rainforest area, uh, particularly uh, things like malaria uh, and those types of problems which are endemic in the region. Uh, and so the local people are getting uh, treatments and, and help uh, where they normally wouldn't have access to medical, medical facilities. Uh, we use our facilities on, on the property and on the site to, to outreach to those locations. 
Uh, we're continuing with our other stakeholder activities and stakeholder mapping efforts and uh, also uh, starting to look at a rehabilitation and reforestation program with the forestry ministry. So in terms of the company's uh, current uh, share price and share structure, so we're about 70% institutionally held, the largest shareholders, Dundee Resources, uh, Jupiter, Barrick, uh, Condire, Libra, and RBC GAM uh, are the big, biggest shareholders. Um, so we're trading uh, roughly about 0.3 times the uh, uh, analyst estimated net asset value. So we're still relatively undervalued and have an opportunity for anyone who wants to get in on an early stage project like this. Uh, this is a project that we think uh, will eventually be an open pit mine. It's going to be uh, quite a, an attractive open pit mine. The grades are quite good and uh, it's, it's scale wise, it will be a very significant, uh, very significant deposit. And uh, the fact that the, the, uh, the environment for is very friendly for mining, we expect the timing on this and the permitting process to go fairly quickly and the project move from uh, discovery to a production in in a six year time frame so which is which is about a third of the time it normally takes mines to get built today on the average today is somewhere around 17 to 18 years from discovery to production so so it's an exciting environment for us to work in an exciting project and we're looking forward to, to taking the next step to advance this project and, and to bring it to production ultimately Hi, I'm Jeremy Link, the President and CEO of Keep Local Gold. One of the common questions that we get is, what's the difference between gold and nuggety coarse gold? And there's a lot of mysteries around that and that investors don't always understand because it, it is, frankly, a little confusing, uh, the nomenclature. And also, what are the kind of the strategies that are available to overcome what is known as the nugget effect? So most of the materials I'm going to talk about today are educational. Uh, I don't consider myself to be a coarse gold expert, but I am working towards an honorary degree, I feel like. Um, there it will be a little bit of information here about Kiboko Gold, but, um, and, but very little of it will be forward looking. Most of it is just my personal experience with coarse gold and what I find resonates when I speak to investors. So first of all, we got to remember that gold occurs in metallic form because it's mostly inert and non-reactive. It makes very few compounds in nature, unlike most other metals, which form uh, various different compounds. And so because gold occurs natively, it has a bit, it has a tendency to have a bit more erratic distribution relative to other metals, which is where the term, you know, nuggety uh, gold deposits comes from. And gold appears in all different types, shapes, and sizes. So true nuggets, like you see here in the top left, you also see it in, in, in veins where it's clustered. You also find it as individual fine grains uh, of coarse gold, like Kiboko has at its Hurricana project. But you also see it at the microscopic level. Uh, and a great example of that would be a, a copper uh, gold porphyry, in which you can't even see the gold. It's invisible. To help simplify things for investors, though, we like to... The term coarse gold is preferred unless you're truly dealing with nuggets of gold. Coarse gold is just a much more accurate uh, description and more useful for the nomenclature. Now, diving into that nomenclature, what is the difference between nugget effect and in situ nugget effect? A lot of the times these terms are used interchangeably, uh, which is fine amongst the technical community, but it can be really confusing uh, uh, to investors, especially those that are new to the space. So nugget effect is a quantitative geostatistical term that is used in resource estimation. It basically is a measurement of uh, how re reproducible results are between samples in close proximity to each other. And you see, if you've ever seen a variogram, this is at the origin point, the point that is the offset above the zero point. Now it's driven by a lot of different things, but it is dominated by unavoidable equipment accuracy and human areas, errors associated with the, uh, an inadequate sample size, uh, poor preparation, and perhaps poor analysis as well. Another big driver of it is the in situ nugget effect, which is also known as the geological nugget effect, which is a term in used in geology to describe the heterogeneity of the mineralization, 
And it's primarily a function of gold particle size. Is it a microscopic grain? Is it, a, uh, is it an actual visible grain or is it a nugget? The particle size, uh, the distribution of these particles, are they an individual grain? Is it a cluster of them or is it evenly disseminated like you might find in a porphyry? And then on top of it, the geological uh, continuity of the host structures. Is it in a vein that pinches and swells or is it in a, you know, um, in a, a thick vein or perhaps in a porphyry? Now, when we at Kiboko screen projects for uh, coarse gold, which is what we, uh, we specialize in, is we uh, we see that there's a we know there's a pronounced in situ nugget effect when we look at duplicate samples of assay. For example, if a sample grades 0 0.1 grams per ton, but a duplicate sample from that same interval of meter grades, say for example, one gram per ton, an order of magnitude difference, that is a clear indication that you likely have a coarse gold and in situ nugget effect. Now, what does this nugget in situ nugget effect really mean? And how does it relate to coarse gold particle size and the distribution? So you can imagine here that you've got little small flakes or grains of gold. When you go to sample this distribution, because it's not homogeneous, it's a bit erratic, you know, it's not uh, evenly spaced. The size of your sample makes a big difference. You have a real opportunity here if you sample it with a very small sample to get no gold. And that's very common in coarse gold projects during the early days of exploration. And then eventually explorers realize that there's a coarse gold issue and they move to larger sample sizes, which allows you the opportunity to pick up more flakes of these uh, gold, which then reduces the in situ nugget effect. And it's important to understand that this in situ nugget effect occurs at all scales. And you see it at the deposit level, you see it in the drill hole, and you see it in your sample and in your subsamples. It's, it's, it's everywhere in the project. So what, is this, what does this mean? What is the overall effect of this? So what happens is you end up with what's known as a Poisson distribution. And it really emphasizes understanding the Poisson distribution really helps you understand the importance of taking an adequate sample size. You can see here in this figure that we've got a number of various grains of gold in, in this hypothetical sample in which the average grade is one if you were to, you know, assay or, sorry, to, to count all, uh, sorry, the average in this volume is one. And you can see here that if you take a sample from it, that there's a 37% chance that you're going to get no grade in it. And there's a 37% chance you might get one, one ounce, sorry, one grain, two grains, three grains, and so on. And this distribution here, what happens is additive. It compounds upon itself. So you, that, that probability of getting that one grain of gold in your original sample then occurs again when you subsample again and you subsample again. So for example, you drill the deposit, you cut your core in half, you send that to the lab, they split that in half, and then they took out like maybe a 30 gram fire assay. Each time you go through that subsampling process, the probability of the sample containing gold declines and ultimately leads to a statistical underestimation of the grade in the original sample. So how do we overcome this, this Poisson distribution and this nugget effect? So here's some core from Kiboko's um, Hurricane project from the Fontana area. You can see here little grains of gold. Uh, clearly we've got coarse gold and we have a nugget effect. So what kind of strategies do we have to overcome these issues? So and trying to keep it, you know, uh, uh, simple, which it's not, it's actually quite complex, but if you understand the basics, you'll understand the big picture. And so first step we do is collect a large original sample. At Hurricane, most of the drilling is small diameter, which is great or adequate for like homogeneous deposits, but not ideal for coarse gold deposits like Hurricane. So what we will use is large diameter HQ diamond core, and five and a half inch RC drilling, which HQ is three times larger in volume than BQ, and the RC is almost 13 times larger than BQ. And why this is important is because it creates a more representative original sample. And the metaphor I like to use for this is you catch more fish with a net than you do with a spear. Step number two, assay large samples using coarse gold specific techniques. You know you've got coarse gold, you've seen it, but it's amazing the number of times people don't go ahead and do the coarse gold testing. And I think that's a function of that it's not 
Uh, the theory of sampling is not well taught at school. And there is a uh, so-called there's an attitude among some people who don't have course code experience that what worked in the past on another deposit should work on this one. And so as a result, sometimes these projects get overlooked. So what's the, what are some course code specific techniques? Well, metallic screen fire assay is one that's quite popular in amongst investors. Over the last decade, leach well has become very popular as well, particularly in West Africa and Western Australia, where you have uh, most of the systems are dominated by coarse gold. And then the new player on the scene is photon assay, which uses X-rays to excite the gold, and then you measure the gamma rays that come off of it. Um, the advantages of all these methods is that you use larger samples, typically 500 grams or more, and often multi multiple kilograms are assay. Versus traditional fire assay, you're doing 10 to 50 grams. So then you get that small sample that may not be representative of the original sample. Kiboko prefers photon assay because it's a simple process and it preserves the sample for additional test work where traditional fire assay will destroy the sample in the process. And to help understand the difference that the right technique can make, here's a comparison of traditional fire assays to screen fire assays that were taken during a bulk sample at, Herican at Kiboko's Herakana project. In the 1980s, they took a... Um, a bulk sample from the Hooper vein. You can see here that they processed about 1,600 uh, tons of material. The fire assays reported a weighted average grade of 2.6 grams per ton, which is fantastic. You know, at Kiboko, we're looking for a near service open pit style project, and many people would probably consider those grades to be high grade. But what's really interesting is that they took screen fire assays concurrently alongside the this traditional fire assay. And what we see here is that the weighted average grade from the screen fire assay, which is a coarse gold technique, was 4.7 grams per ton, a little over 80% higher than the traditional fire assay. Now, this doesn't mean that we're expecting at Kiboko to see an average increase in grade of 80% over the historical drill results. But the importance of this is, is to understand that uh, what a coarse gold specific technique, the difference it can make. Because from this bulk sample, the mill reported an overall average grade of 4.98 grams per ton indicating that the screen fire assay provided a much more uh, representative measurement of the grade for the sample that was processed at the mill. Now, that all refers largely to the in situ nugget effect. But another component of the nugget effect that you would recall is the human component. Now, we like photon assay and leach well as well for a similar reason, because it means fewer steps in the process which provides fewer opportunities for errors to be introduced. Fire assay, proven, great, uh, great method for um, you know, the right deposit type, but it's complex. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that's just by the time you've got the sample you know, to the lab. Whereas photon assay, you've got three steps and very little, only one, and very little of the steps involve humans. So there's a fewer mistakes. And because there's fewer steps, that also reduces the unavoidable sampling errors, you know, the accuracy associated with a certain device. We also like photon assay because the sample is preserved, which allow because the process is non-destructive, which allows us to, you know, have the sample tested at a different photon assay lab or sent for a different assay technique. Whereas with fire assay, once you've acted it, it's gone. And the third step, and probably the most important step, and really should be the first step, is to work with proven coarse gold experts. Our team is led by Dr. Olivia Thevenias, who's our VP Geology, and Ivor Jones, our VP Technical Services, both of whom are proven coarse gold experts. Here's the list of some of the projects that our team has been associated with. Um, in fact, everyone at Kiboko met while working at uh, Kalana's, um, sorry, at Apple's Kalana project, uh, where we defined a multi-million ounce resource. But you know, Ivor has been also associated with Continental Gold's Bird Ticket Project and Tritium's Bruce Jack Gold Mine. Now, I won't go into each one of these stories individually, but what I will say is that they all had long exploration histories before they were evaluated using coarse gold techniques. And once they were, tons and ounces were added quickly. These companies had access to capital regardless of market conditions and were ultimately acquired by larger companies. Which 
is why in Kiboko we're looking to do that again. So I would be it'd be I may be remiss if I didn't put a little plug for Kiboko in here to the presentation. You know, Kiboko is a proven course book exploration team. We've acquired a large land position that we consolidated in 55 kilometers north of Eldor, arguably the best mining jurisdiction in the world. The project is data rich. We've actually defined, uh, sorry, we have outlined a multi-million ounce exploration target, which you can learn more about in one of our other six presentations. We've just completed an 11,000 meter, um, 68 hole drill program, and the assays are pending, which is gonna be quite exciting because exciting we're using core school specific techniques there for the, which, for the first time. This is all expected to lead up to a maiden mineral resource that we're report in the middle of this year. If you have any further questions about coarse gold, uh, the assay techniques, uh, and, the other, and the sampling protocols, please feel free to reach out to me, or if you want to learn more about Kiboka Gold, which is traded on the TSX Venture under the symbol KIV. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is David Christie. I'm the president and CEO of Orford Mining Corp. We are a gold and, and critical minerals explorer, principally in the province of Quebec in Canada. Our ticker symbol is ORM. We trade it on the Venture Exchange, the TSX Venture. I will be making some forward-looking statements. I'll have you read those at your leisure. So Orford has four key project areas. First of all, the Kigavik Gold Project, 402 square kilometers of land, brand new gold district in the Nunavik region of Quebec. We've seen uh, very high grades at surface, visible gold and core. Um, and we think this year, 2023, is going to be a transformative, transformative year for the project. The West Raglan Nickel Project, 713 square kilometers of land. It's now 51% to Wailu. They've earned up to that point and they've made the option to go to 70 and 49% Orford. Uh, Wailu continues to earn in drilling last year of 2,500 meters and discover some new sulfide bodies. Then we have the Nunavik Lithium Project. Just staked this at the beginning of February. This is ground surrounding our West Raglan and Kigavik project that is very prospective for lithium, never been explored for anything. Um, the government of Quebec had uh, done lake bottom sediment samples, mapped pegmatites, um, and has lithium in bedrock in, uh, in grab samples that uh, was anomalous. Uh, so we're quite excited about what we see there. Uh, and all these projects sit on very strong geological boundaries, which is a key thing for lithium. And then we have our Jatel Gold Copper area, uh, 260 square kilometers. We just finished a drill program on our uh, Jatel Eagle project. This project has shown some very good grades, and we expect some more in the, in the coming week. So you can see on this map here, it shows you where most of our projects are sitting in the Nunavik region of Quebec and the Jatel Gold project sits down in the Abbot Tibi. And then we have a few, a couple of royalties down in Columbia. We bought a private company in 2018 for the cash it had on hand and it came with uh, two royalties. And we're watching those with quite a bit of interest. Outcrop Gold and Barakia Gold are, are working on those two projects. Market cap sitting around 25, 26 million right now. It's uh, had a good move since we announced our lithium uh, acquisitions. Alamos Gold sits at over 24 percent. Uh, Corora Resor Resources is still a big shareholder. They're one of the founding shareholders. Uh, and then we have a number of institutions in there and management and a big retail shareholdings. Management team, uh, myself, uh, geologist for many years with uh, many different groups, including Nico Eagle. Um, and then I was a uh, analyst with both uh, Scotia and TD. And follow that up, I was on the uh, the Dundee uh, Asset Management Group. Um, and then I was also on the board of eCobalt Solutions, Cisco Mining, and Condor Precious Metals. And I helped to form today's Cisco Mining. I was CEO of a company called Eagle Hill. Uh, it had the asset to Windfall Lake, which is today's Cisco Mining. Uh, Alger St. John and Michelle Sorrentino, very well-known geologists. Uh, Alger has got many, many years in the nickel world. And Michelle is a, a great uh, geologist on the, both the gold and the nickel side. Our, our board uh, of directors is, is quite strong. John McCluskey joined our board. He is the CEO of Alamos Gold. Uh, Lauren Smith, ex-asset manager. Peter McPhail was the COO of Alamos. He's retired since then. Mark Goodman, ex-Dundee. Uh, ben Pullinger, uh, he is the uh, vice president of exploration for Atex Resources. Really good geologist. Uh, Monique Rabideau, well-known Bay Street lawyer. So the Kigavik project, 
Setting up in Nunavik, as I mentioned, we're about 60 kilometers south of the town of Saliwit. We're in the Cape Smith Belt. This is a prolific belt for minerals. Uh, the Raglan Nickel Deposit that uh, Glencore operates and the Nunavik Nickel Deposit that Canadian Royalties uh, operates, the uh, Xinjin Mining, are, are sitting just to the east of us, about 80 kilometers. Um, our two projects, Kigavik and West Raglan, sit in the Cape Smith Belt. Uh, Raglan is uh, West Raglan is in the, uh, the more uh, spreading ridge type rocks. Uh, the Ultra Mafix, and then the Cape Smith, uh, the Kivik project is in the parent group, which is uh, north of the Bergeron Fault and is a much more gold inducive uh, environment. It's never been explored before us, the, the Kivik project. Um, it's very similar geologically to big belts in the world, such as the Ashanti uh, Gold Belt in West Africa. So it's got great gold endowment uh, from that point of view. Why did we get excited about this project? This map sure shows surface sample anomalies across the project that we've discovered since we started working there. And you can see we got some really spectacular grades up to 648 grams. So we're quite excited about this project. We have drilled a number of holes. Almost all our drill holes have very good, very strong gold endowment. Uh, we're still looking for that really big kicker. Uh, we think this coming summer is going to be the summer where we're going to find that. This is one of the things we, we find. This is the Anik uh, trend. It's about a 3.7 kilometer long boulder trend. Uh, you can see the the type of mineralization we're seeing there is very quartz rich with lots of sulfides. Uh, we think this trend has now multiple sources along this trend in a structural environment. You can see the green line there and then cross cuts with uh, other northeastern structures. And this is probably where we're going to target. We did a, a glacial interpretation with one of the best glacial mines in the business, Stu Averill. He believes we need to drill right underneath the boulders. We were thinking previously that there was more transport distance. We did discover some really good quartz carbonate gold systems uh, to the south of uh, the head of our boulder train, but we, he believes that we're going to find much more gold very close to where we found the boulders. So that's the plan. This summer, we're going to use a RAB drill. We're going to drill right underneath the, those targets. We're going to drill between 40 and 60 holes this summer, 60 to 100 meter holes. Uh, so we're going to test a lot of targets. This just gives you an idea of the anomalies across the property. You can see that we have a lot of other golden till anomalies besides the area we've been working on, which is down in this area. So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, across the property drilling holes this summer, and we're quite excited about that. Moving on to gold exploration, the Abitibi on our Chattel projects. Chattel projects sit right in the center of the Abitibi near the old uh, Eagle Tell Bell mine that uh, Ignico Eagle operated till 1993. And on the same break, the Casa Berardi break that the Casa Berardi mine sits on that uh, Hecla operates. So we're in a, we're in great district for gold. We sit next door to uh, what is the Ignico Eagle uh, Maple Gold JV. This is all the ground to the northeast uh, of us and to the southeast of us. The, the Jatel Eagle project is about a 12 kilometer long uh, strike extent along the main break. We've got a zone called the South Gold Zone that we've been concentrating on. So it's right in the middle of the project. This zone last year, we drilled three holes into it, proved that there was uh, continuity and mineralization. In the past, uh, the, the previous operators didn't sample all the core. They only sampled the sulfide parts. We sampled the more disseminated mineralization and found that it was more continuous and, and thicker. And that's what we were going after this year when we started our drilling. We drilled 2,500 meters in 15 holes. And you can see uh, the holes across here. And, and But we've now discovered what we believe is northeast trending high-grade structure as well. And that was seen in hole number four. We hit 4.1 grams over 14.6 meters with up to 8.6 over 2 meters in there. So this is something we haven't seen in this, this body before. So we have proven the continuity of, of the low-grade mineralization, but we're now seeing this high-grade kicker cutting across the mineralization. Uh, so we're quite ex excited to see the rest of the assays. Uh, we've only got two holes back so far, uh, and we expect the rest of them to come in in the coming weeks. This just gives you an idea on the long section. You can see some of the historical holes as well as some of our holes. Um, so it, this thing hangs together. Um, in, in the past, uh, the, the drilling, they only sampled, like I mentioned, the, the shiny bits in the core. We have sampled the whole core. They also redacted a number of the holes, so they, we didn't know what they actually hit in the past. Um, so we've now confirmed the mineralizations there. We're seeing higher grade mineralization in hole number four. Um, so we're quite excited about the potential of this, this zone uh, to get towards a resource. Moving to the north again, back up to Nunavik, to our Nickel and West, uh, West Raglan project and to our Lithium project. 
First of all, just quickly on what we believe the, the demand for the lithium and nickel is going to be. You know, if you look at uh, both uh, light vehicle sales for electric vehicles and for uh, hybrid vehicles, the battery needs for these is going to be huge. Uh, and the you can notice yourself on the highway, you see more and more electric cars. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. There's different kinds of batteries. They all use a lot of lithium uh, and they all use quite a bit of nickel. So we don't think that's going to change. We see that demand continuing moving forward. Nickel demand and, and usage is just increasing all the more as we move forward here. And we think that demand is going to continue to increase. Uh, you know, in 20, 2005 to 2019, we, we're up about 30% from that going into 2019 to 2025. So great demand for nickel going forward. You see here the pricing of uh, lithium concentrates around the world. Uh, it's just been increasing exponentially. And the, the amount of inventories that are sitting in, in China right now of lithium concentrates is quite low, um, the lowest it's ever been in the past, uh, you know, five years or so. So we think we're going to see this continue to increase. So just looking at our lithium projects, you can see the red properties here uh, sitting to the north and south of our both Kegavik Gold Project and West Raglan Nickel Project. There's actually some lithium potential on our Kegavik Project. We have a number of anomalies in some of the rocks samples we've taken. We, sta we stake these uh, the ground based on uh, lake bottom sed sediment samples, mapped pegmatites, and you can see those in purple on the map, um, and anomalous grab samples in those in in the pegmatites and in other rocks uh, on those pieces of property and geological boundaries that have been mapped. And this is all based on government information. There's been no exploration on these projects. Uh, so we're quite excited to get in there and look at that. We picked out the best parts uh, of these trends um, where there was mapped pegmatites. We got all of those. Uh, we got the best lithium anomalies. Uh, so we're quite excited to get in there and spend some time. This gives you a closer view of the, both the north trend and the south trend and what we staked. So we're very close to our project and to the sound, town of Saliwit. One thing I'd like to point out, the, the port of Deception Bay, uh, where Raglan and uh, Nunavik Nickel ship out their ore, is just about 70 to 100 kilometers away from all our projects. Um, so this is very good when you think about it. We're, we're, only, uh, we're very close to a port that's open all year long. Uh, Raglan and Nunavik Nickel keep it open with an icebreaker. Um, so that has great logistical advantage if we're going to ship out spodumene concentrates. When we look at our project versus uh, the James Bay project on the left, you'll see the James Bay project, and that's the Lake Bottom Sediment Sample uh, Survey, uh, versus our project on the right. We are as good or better as, as far as the anomalies we see on our projects, uh, so we're quite excited about that. Moving on to nickel. So, like I mentioned, Wailu Metals has earned up to 51% now, and they've made the option to go to uh, uh, up to 70. They have to spend another $5 million to get there. Uh, we're in the Cape Smith belt. This is a prolific belt for nickel. It's probably one of the best nickel belts in the world. The Raglan nickel mine produces their nickel for basically negative cash costs right now because of the copper and platinum palladium credits. They have the same reserves basically today as when they open the mine. They continue to replace reserves. So we believe we have the same kind of potential on our West Raglan project. We're looking for two different kinds of deposits here. On the right is the Raglan model. They have about uh, 92 different lenses in 12 distinct zones. You can see they're like pearls on a string. Whereas on the Canadian royalty side, it's more of a massive deposit, but lower nickel to copper ratio. So they are like 1% nickel, 1% copper, one to one ratio. Whereas at uh, Raglan, it's a three to one ratio. So we're getting like 3% nickel and 1% copper there. This is one of our zones, the frontier zone, probably the best drilled zone so far of our project. Uh, we've extended the size of it on the Western side and in the center. Uh, this summer with a couple holes um, and uh, you can see the grades here they're just spectacular 3.2 percent nickel 1.3 percent copper uh, three grams pge plus there's a bit of cobalt in over 28 meters these are like spectacular grades you don't see this very often this summer we did uh, discover a brand new sulfide lens this is the first new lens outside of the uh the frontier zone and the best grade that's been intersected at a frontier 4.2 meters of 0.6 percent nickel it's just the first first hole into this thing so we're quite excited about getting in there again and drilling more holes great relationship with the first nations both in the abitibi and in nunavik uh, we try to employ as many uh, nunavik inuit enterprises as we can 
and employ as many people from that area of the world as we can. So just summing up the company really quickly, strategic shareholder support from Alamos Gold is very strong. Massive uh, land position in what we believe are two underexplored gold districts. You know, the Chatel area hadn't been explored since before 1993 when Ignique Weagle closed its mine, and until recently when Maple Gold and, and we started drilling. And then in Nunavik, no one explored the Kigavik project. That is a brand new gold district. There's not 40 years of exploration history. So this is pretty, pretty new and exciting stuff. Then, of course, we have a large new land tenure covering very strong lithium targets in Nunavik. Strong financial and technical partner on our West Raglan nickel pro project with Wailu Metals. It's the same guys who bought the Norant, uh, bought Norant last year and are, are aggressively exploring that and developing it. And, of course, we're in one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world in Quebec. Very supportive. Uh, great place to be. And we have a massive land position, 1,800 square kilometers across uh, the province of Quebec. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Six Mix session. Uh, my name is Rick Van Eisen. I'm the president and CEO of Contango Ore. I'm going to walk you through our corporate presentation. Here we have our forward-looking statement. Uh, I want to talk to you today about our Moncho project. It's a development stage project in Alaska. Uh, we're partnered with Kinross, who own 70% and on land that's owned by the Tetlin uh, Native Tribe. The second project I want to introduce you to is our Lucky Shot mine. Uh, where we're exploring for high-grade underground uh, gold. Um, I won't talk to you about our early stage exploration projects, but uh, perhaps you can take a look at our website. Our Montreal project is a, is a development stage project. Uh, we're approaching production. We've discovered a 1.3 million ounce gold deposit next to uh, the uh, Alaska Highway there, uh, located by the Gold Star, on land owned by the Tetlin tribe. We uh, formed a joint venture with Kinross in 2000 and, uh, 2020, and uh, we are now uh, on the cusp of getting into production by this time next year. The whole approach here has been to develop the mine uh, at the Mancho site, but then truck the ore up to the Fort Knox mill, uh, which is located by that red star in the previous uh, image. Uh, we've worked now towards uh, completing a feasibility study. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, presenting that uh, to uh, to our shareholders here in a few weeks. Uh, we are under construction. We've received our 404 permit, um, and we are expecting to be in production uh, around this time next year. Now, recently, we just announced that we um, engaged ING and McCrary. Uh, for a bank loan, to arrange a bank loan for about $70 million. It's a financing package that'll finance our 30% of all construction and uh, uh, working capital costs related to the Mancho project. So a pretty uh, pretty significant milestone that we just worked our way through here. Uh, Kinross announced economics uh, for the feasibility study. Uh, the mine will produce about uh, 914,000 ounces of gold. Um, uh, averaging about 225,000 ounces a year, our 30% share, 67,500 ounces per ton. Or, or, sorry, 67,500 ounces. Um, now, the grade that we'll be delivering to the Fort Knox mill is pretty special. Eight grams per ton, very high grade for an open pit gold mine. Capital cost came in at 182, and I'm pleased to say we're about 90% uh, completed or committed today, and we're, uh, we're on budget. Um, our all in sustaining costs are expected to be about $1,100 uh, per ounce. Again, what makes this project special, for, especially from an Alaska context, is uh, that we're right next to the highway. So we have very little infrastructure to build here. Uh, you can see the Montreal project in the hills behind the bushes there. Uh, we will process the ore at the Fort Knox Mill, which has been operating for over 25 years. Um, and the deposit the tailings there as well. So this avoids a huge amount of capital, a huge amount of risk, a huge amount of permitting, which is time. Uh, so we are able to get this project up and running in a, a fairly uh, efficient uh, way capital-wise, but also time-wise. Uh, we received our 404 wetlands permit in the summertime as uh, early August, and we started construction of the access road uh, between the uh, highway and the mine site. And this is so that the highway trucks carrying the ore up to the Fort Knox mill 
can easily make the uh, trip uh, year round. Uh, we've continued to work on the road all winter. Uh, I was up there a few weeks ago and, and sites looking, uh, looking really good and uh, the roads advancing uh, very well. We've also completed a 200 person camp uh, just outside the town of Toke, which is uh, nearby on the Alaska Highway there. Um, and one thing we're really proud of is that this facility will be turned back over to the uh, Tetland tribe at the end of the mine life uh, to be used as an elder's home. So I think uh, a good, good, good story they're giving back to the community. Uh, the other thing that's going on is some site works at, uh, at the Fort Knox mill, uh, mill modifications, uh, basically because our ore is uh, so much higher grade than the average ore at Fort Knox, we need more tankage for, uh, for carbon, for cyanide destruct, uh, and for lime. Uh, so that is also another uh, activity that's going on throughout the wintertime here. At the Mancho site, it's a really a simple quarry operation. Two open pits, uh, non-acid generating uh, materials uh, next to the pit, uh, deposited development rock, and then temporary storage for the potential acid generating material, which will be put back in the bottom of the pit at the end of the mine life. Um, uh, we will start mining when we uh, have the receipt of the mine operating permit, which we are expecting in late April. Uh, so again, we're, we're well on the way to, to uh, making this project a reality. Uh, we've engaged uh, Kiwit as the mine contractor. Uh, they've been in business a long time. They're one of the largest in the world. Uh, so they can certainly deliver uh, when, when we need this. Uh, Black Gold Transport will be hauling the ore um, up to the Fort Knox mill. Uh, they've been in business in Alaska for 35 years and uh, they're certainly one of the preeminent uh, transporters in Alaska. Now, just talking about exploration, um, just a little bit, uh, the two black areas there are the two, the two pits, the North Mancho and Main Mancho deposits. And you can see in the surface geochemistry here, there's a lot of exploration upside uh, right around what we call the Chief Danny area, right around uh, the known deposits. Um, and of course, that represents just a very small part of the overall Tetlin lease uh, that the joint venture uh, has leased from the Tetlin tribe. Uh, that area in the previous slide is completely within that circle there. So you can see there's a lot of exploration here, a lot of exploration potential here. Um, and just roughly the, the size of the Tetlin lease is the size of Rhode Island. So uh, this is in the middle of the Tintina gold belt, very prolific gold belt. You can see we've got two other claim blocks uh, that we own 100%, that Contango owns 100% of. Uh, just uh, outside of the Tetlin lease. So we'll be doing some more exploration work on those as well. But of course, the main event is to get uh, Mancho into production. And we plan to get that done uh, uh, by the, around, roughly this time next year. So uh, while Kinross does most of the heavy lifting on uh, advancing our Mancho project, that leaves us free to, uh, to work on our other projects. Um, and the one I want to re review today, well, we see today is the Lucky Shot Mine. Uh, located just north of Anchorage. Uh, it's about an hour and a half drive north of Anchorage. This was a mine that was in production in the 30s and 40s, shut down in 1942 when President Roosevelt used the War Act to shut down all gold mining in the United States. They mined quartz and free gold here. It's a very simple gravity flotation operation uh, and had very good recoveries uh, of gold up, up in the uh, 85 to 90 percent range. This mine, um, as I mentioned, was uh, shut down in 1942. At that time, it had produced a quarter million ounces at roughly an ounce and a half per ton, 40 grams per ton. Uh, it was never mined since. Um, there's been two main periods of exploration, uh, one that focused on the Coleman part of the vein, which is the same vein, but just slightly off the photo. Uh, they outlined uh, a resource there of a little over 200,000 tons, averaging 18 grams per ton for 120,000 ounces of gold. Um, and then at the Lucky Shot uh, in 1980, a group called InSearch put a tunnel in, uh, but they never actually got to the vein. They, uh, it was an oil and gas company and is it decided after a few years that the gold business just wasn't for them. So it was a good plan, uh, but it didn't, didn't achieve the objective. Here's a lucky shot vein uh, outlined in, in the red line there. It's over a mile in strike length between the war baby, the main lucky shot where the quarter million ounces uh, of gold were recovered from 
uh, and then over at the Coleman with 120,000 ounces of resource are. These will be historic resources. Um, now, and in the middle here is the in-search tunnel. So it went back underneath the mountain uh, with the objective of getting to the vein, but uh, in-search never quite got all the way there. So we just picked up where they left off. This is a, an aerial photograph. You can see the, the lucky shot tunnel here, and then this, the spaghetti works back here. That's where the quarter million ounces of gold came from. So we've extended now the in-search tunnel. We've refurbished it, the beginning part of it, and then extended it now to the, all the way to the, to the vein and put a drift uh, on the west side so that we can drill the vein uh, from, from the hanging wall side of the, uh, of the vein. Which is what we've been doing over the last uh, last year here. Uh, so this is a cross-sectional view, showing the in-search tunnel. The purple here are the pilot holes we drilled to know where the vein was going. Uh, the green is the extension of the in-search tunnel that we put in. Uh, the red is where it was historically mined, the Lucky Shot vein, and you can see we're basically just drilling the down dip portion of that vein, and we can drill it from the hanging wall. Uh, when we get across on the other side, but uh, right now we're just drilling it from the foot wall side to define more resources. We've drilled a to total of 29 holes. We've hit the vein every time we've drilled a hole. Uh, oftentimes it has free gold in it, so we, we know that's going to run pretty well. Uh, the idea is to drill a series of fans on relatively close space centers uh, to define the vein and the, and the associated uh, structures, uh, generally in the foot wall of the vein. This is a perspective of oblique view looking uh, to the southwest. Um, and you see at the Coleman, there's 171 holes drilled that define the Coleman resource of 120,000 ounces. Uh, this uh, fleshy colored zone here is where the quarter million ounces of historic resources came from, from Lucky Shot. Um, and then in circled in red is the area that we've focused on, uh, on our resources. These are historic resources written here. They were done by, uh, previous owners. Uh, we can't rely on them. Uh, we're going to do our own drilling and our own analysis of this data. Um, and when we come out with our resource uh, for Lucky Shot here in the next uh, next few weeks. Um, if we focus on that area, this is uh, another perspective view looking to the southwest. The in-search tunnel comes in here. We put this western drift in. Uh, planned drifts off to the east and then in, across the vein and then the hanging wall. And you can see just a huge number of drill holes here uh, to better define the overall resource of the Lucky Shot uh, segment of the vein. Pretty much like we, that's been done already for the Coleman uh, part of the vein where, we, uh, uh, where we've got all, already have 170 drill holes. Uh, we'll augment the Lucky Shot side here and we should be able to, uh, our objective would be to outline somewhere between a quarter million and a and a half million ounces of resource um, so that we can develop a mine plan around that. Uh, give us two years to do that, um, but I think uh, we've got a good shot at uh, developing a high grade uh, mine here where it can uh, easily develop a, a nice mine that would be maybe generating about 30 to 50,000 ounces of gold a year. Uh, and again, this is something that we own 100% of. So I will stop there and see if there are any questions. And if you're, uh, uh, if you have questions, just uh, please send them through to uh, our website, um, info at Contango or, uh, or give us a call and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. I thank you very much.